Welcome back to Sparkle on Substack with me, Claire Venus. I'm so excited because this morning I have Clover Stroud with me and Clover and I have met once before on Zoom and I've been following our work well before that and ever since and it's been really beautiful to see Clover arrive on Substack and carve out this really beautiful unique space for herself and our work and also I've been very curiously leaning in to how book promotion can feel just seamless and just part of what you want to say in life and I think Clover does that so brilliantly so I'll let Clover introduce herself and we're going to delve into all things authorship, Substack and some more in between I'm sure. Hi Clover! Hi Claire, it's really really lovely to be here, it's lovely to see your face and it's lovely to um, be having a chat with you so thank you very very much for inviting me on. Yeah so I am a writer and a journalist and a podcaster, I've got a podcast called Tiny Acts of Bravery about bravery, I've had sort of 25, a career of 25 years as a journalist for all the national press and I have my fourth memoir because my writing is very very confessional that's what I do is I write about the way life feels and I, I sort of take one aspect of life whether it's motherhood or grief or my most recent book is about home and what home really means and I really really delve into what that feels like so the newest book is called The Giant on the Skyline it's looking lovely I have to say myself it's very very beautiful I work with a local artist to where I lived in Oxfordshire designing the cover called Anna Dillon who's an amazing woman but the book is about because um, I'm actually, you know, we're speaking. I'm I'm at six a.m. here because I'm living in Washington D.C. And the book was um, inspired by my husband saying we need to go and live in America because we were live we were basically living pretty much, kind of, almost separately basically because he was he was over here so much or traveling for work, the opportunity came to move here and leaving my home in South Oxfordshire, which is close to kind of the ancient Ridgeway and the landscape, really, really beautiful landscape covered in standing stones and and um, hill forts and, and a chalk horse. Leaving that landscape was really hard. And it really, really made me think about, well, what is home? Is home a place we carry inside us? Is it a landscape or a cityscape if somebody loves, particularly feels at home in a city? Is it memory? Is it people? What, what is it? So that's what the, this newest book is about. And I'm excited. I've had wonderful reactions to it so far from early readers. Oh, the early readers. Yeah, there's all of these phases, isn't there? Like, obviously, I'm not a published author. So when I hear from you guys and hear about these phases that you go through, this process mm. that you go through of kind of people responding to your work and then getting ready for launch, which is the bit that you're in now. It's so exciting to me. It's a whole new world. And I know that book writing can take quite a while and there's a whole load of mm. things that happen in the editing process. We've been learning bits as we go and I know my listeners are really keen on that. But the theme, Clover, I mean, wow, like what a powerful and universal theme. Like I feel like when I heard you talk about that for the first time, it really resonated with some of the more kind of promenade art like interactive art pieces that I've been thinking about and working on and what I've been offering out to my community from my Northumberland cottage and there's this kind of tightrope where we're walking at the moment where we want to move but we felt so at home here like both of us you know myself and my husband and my kids are like part of the fabric of here you know like everything, oh. you know, the seasonal kind of shifts and everything. And as they're growing up, you know, you kind of go, this is where my son stood and that's how tall he was. And all of those little marks and cute yeah. stuff that you do. It's exactly. like, how could I leave this? It's like leaving a museum of who we've been, right? So mm. we're in that space of going, okay, this feels brave. And I really connect to what you said about, about that, about that move to Washington, because I've been to Washington, very, very different to Oxfordshire. <laughs> <laughs> very, yes. No, and exactly, I mean, for me, I had worked really hard to create a home where, where the kids, I've got five children, where they felt secure. They felt part of something kind of beautiful, part of something spiritual. That was for me, but also for them, that there was kind of, places of ritual or places of um, joy, you know, places that we went for a picnic or, and when I say places of ritual, I don't mean like we were going off and sort of, you know, burning candles in the woods all every week, although we did occasionally do stuff like that, but it's more, okay, this is where we, you know, the, the village shop where they used to like to go and buy their pot noodles, friends that they had, places that we would go for a picnic after school with just, you know, a packet of digestive biscuits and a bottle of squash. It doesn't, it's not sort of, like it's not complicated but it's like it felt very very much like their home and my home and I think I mean I'm really fascinated by the feeling of 
homesickness and what that is because I could be standing in my kitchen and I would feel homesick I was like well what is this feeling actually what am I yearning for what am I longing for and I had felt finally in the place that, that we were living in South Oxfordshire which is a beautiful landscape and when I say it's remote that probably sounds a bit ridiculous you know but it is actually the the area where we were living was was relatively remote it was 45 minutes from the train station so you couldn't really you can't really commute into London from there and it's it's very very um special place for me so leaving that was really really hard and and I really didn't want to and the and and the book really kind of um explores those sort of themes and 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 I express you know, I kind of create a portrait of the area that we live, which I hope is very kind of beautiful nature writing. But then there are also quite complicated themes around, you know, memory and feeling and loss. And and also it coincided with my elder kids leaving for university. So the complexities of the family, the shape of the family changing, um, all things that I'm really, really fascinated by. And, and I really try in my writing to take the reader right into my personal experience for them to feel it with me because what i found is that the more personal i am the more specific i am about my life the more other people can see aspects of their own life reflected there and that's what i find really beautiful about the writing that i do is that i know that it kind of reaches out and helps other people in some way or another it touches them it, it connects me to them and them to me and that's just such a privilege which i don't take for granted at all um so I'm excited about this book. And yeah, living in DC has been, you know, we we did, I'm not giving anything away when I say that we did, we did decide to leave. We're not going to be here forever. I think that would be really, really hard. But a new life in America is interesting, but it is, I mean, I was right to be worried about it. It's very, very hard. And you do, if you belong in a place or you feel as though you're connected to a place in some way, when you leave it, you do lose a lot, you know, you you and community and relationships with people is so valuable and ultimately home I think is about is about friendships and and community and those people that you see every day who might not be your like best friends your oldest friends but they are really really important people that that you have a chat with when you're walking the kids to school or or doing a bit of shopping or you know walking the dogs whatever those just kind of little parts of day-to-day -day life and the people you see around that are incredibly yeah so so important and I miss them and I miss that um but yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited to to share the themes of the book. And one of the things I love about social media in all its different forms and Substack is being able to have that conversation with readers, you know. Yeah, I mean, you share so generously. And I felt this before you come to some Substack and I was having a look at the way that you share on Instagram. I was like, this is really unique. You know, I've not seen this way of connecting and this way of storytelling and holding somebody in that story. It, because Instagram is relatively short a space to be able to kind of draw people in, but you do it so brilliantly and so generously. And I just think for me, it was like, this is a whole world within a world, you know, and that is the... It's the discombobulating thing about online living, but there is those little pockets of connection that are so precious and you create that so well. I just want to just give you that compliment. Oh, it's gorgeous. You. Thank you. No, it's really important to me. And I love Instagram for that space, actually. And for the, and that, you know, that was kind of where I, I kind of started doing during the pandemic. I started doing talking to camera and that really, really connected with people. And I think it's a real, um, you know, I think I think Instagram is actually incredible for that fast. I was doing it yesterday when I was on a walk uh, through a certain part of DC and I suddenly found this beautiful stream like near to the main road. And it was I did some stories last night. It's like this is really odd. I'm like in the middle of a capital city and then I'm walking beside this stream that looks like I'm in rural Wales or something. It's really lovely. And you just that thing of doing some fast, funny, you know, chat on stories is, is I, I love. And then Substack enables you to take that so much further. You know, it is a really, one of the things I'm loving about Substack is it's a completely original space in that it's my voice. And kind of, when I'm writing journalism and with my books as well, I am, uh, you know, I'm being edited in some way or another. Whereas in Substack, I can write exactly what I want. And I, and I, I don't have any problem with writing, you know, I, 
I, I, I've been writing since I was 23 and I'm now 49. I've done it as I've always had it as my career. So I, I know how to write fast and I can produce produce words. You know, I have a lot to say, in other words. And it's been really fun using that space to write, you know, big, bigger, much, much bigger essays to be able to really go there with certain certain ideas. And I'm looking forward to kind of doing more video and using it in other work in other ways to kind of experiment with different ways of connecting because for me being a writer that thing of having the relationship with the readers and and is 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 so important the communication with people communicating ideas i really want to be read of course i want to sell books for you know i need to for my for my career i need to i want to i want to be successful as we all do but i want that because i want I want to be able to talk to other people about the stuff that interests me and and you know Substack and and book writing enable me to to do that um and I'm excited by you know the way Substack enables that I think it is an I think it's a brilliant it's a brilliant platform mm, well you and me both you know I am so passionate about Substack and I think you know coming and arriving there when it was a relatively quiet space and relatively skewed towards American writers was like oh this is cool. This is interesting. And then watching it shift and change and encouraging people to arrive and kind of bed in and decide what they want it to be for them, like how they want to set it up. Yes, of course, but how they want to kind of go deeper with what we are able to do there and that could be right in long form for sure but now we've got more options in terms of a free podcast hosting space we've got the video option we've got ways to hold community that just work so effortlessly because they are already there and they're already open to mm -hmm. reading our words so I'd love to just circle back Clover and just understand your arrival to Substack and and how that was for you like you you know about this platform maybe other writer friends have talked about it and you're like yeah okay like I'll arrive there and I'll see what I want to do there like have you been since you arrived and, and do let me know when it was because I'm I'm um yeah a little bit shaky on that timeline I know it's relatively recently let me know what it was like to arrive and then if you had a bit of a plan to start with or you were kind of just doing the suck it and see and see how everybody kind of responds to your work I'd love to know more about that and how it felt yeah, so I'd been sort of aware of it for a while. Um, Emma Gannon is a friend, and we—I remember her going on to it. It was actually at the time of my my previous book launch, which was exactly two years ago. A book that I wrote about grief called *The Red of My Blood*, and she came to my book launch and she said, "Oh, can I?" She got some copies because she was going to do a special giveaway. She said, "I'm on Substack. You'd really love it there. You should come over there." And I sort of. I think I might have like even registered at that point, but I had a lot going on. You know, there's always a lot going on in life. And I, um, and then I kept thinking, you know, I kept seeing people posting about it on Instagram. So what is, what is Substack? I didn't know what it was. And, and then, um, and then we were moving over. So I thought, okay, I'm definitely going to start writing on that. It looks really interesting. And then we were moving here and I was also finishing the giant on the skyline and I was launching my podcast, tiny acts of bravery. And I had, Moving a family of five with two children staying in England, three coming with us. We had lots of animals. It was really, last summer was really, really complicated. And I was on a book deadline and I had this, I was doing podcast recordings. So I couldn't manage it. And then we got here and I thought, okay, I'm going to go on to it. And I actually spoke with you last autumn and I kind of had a play around with it. To be, you know, to be completely honest, I found it quite complicated the kind of setup, it seems as though there's a lot of things that you have to kind of get to grips with. And whilst I would, I just moved to America and I was very confused by my new life, even doing things like going to the supermarket was complicated because you had to make a decision for every single thing, getting the kids into schools, to clubs, just navigating a new life in a new country. It's a really, really big deal. So I tried in the autumn and I just couldn't get my head straight enough but I was I mean I was preparing you know I was doing some research and then I launched in February and I just uh thought okay I'm gonna you know start writing in the way that I like to write and I'm just gonna see see what happens really and and I knew that I wanted to write for me the kind of quality of the words is really important I really love reading beautiful words I wanted to write impactful um, emotionally driven kind of stuff that would connect with other people. I basically started doing what I do on Instagram, but in a, in longer form. So rather than having this, you know, that short 150 word caption, I could write as really as much as I wanted to basically. And, 
that was the way that I've gone with it. I've done a little bit of video as well because I enjoy, you know, I enjoy doing video and I would like to do more of that. I haven't yet hosted any kind of meetup spaces because I've just had a lot on with the book, but I definitely plan to be doing that. Um, and so that's, and, and I found it really, you know, I set myself, I want to post every week. Um, I put a paywall up within a, I did a month free and then I had a paywall. I'm a, I'm a professional, you know, I'm a writer. It's what I do. Um, I put a lot into my sub stack. I can't put that stuff up for free. I just wouldn't have the time to do it for free. So, but, but there are the occasional public post and quite often quite a big bit of the chunk. I've just written about what it's like putting my life out there publicly and um, what it's like for my kids as well. And quite a lot of that essay, although there is a paywall, quite a lot of it is actually free as well. Um, and I do all my video and stuff is for free too. So I found it, you know, and I found like a nice community growing up, the same people um, commenting on pieces and so on. And also interestingly, people who have not read my work or heard about my work before finding me, which is really, you know, that's really lovely and, and more probably slightly more global following people from all over the place, you know, which is, which is really fantastic. So it's demanding. I definitely, you know, I write my piece on a Friday, I post it on a Tuesday. I've got to get the pictures and graphics together and stuff. It's not a free lunch, but there is no such thing as a free lunch. You know, it's, it's, and I think that I've watched friends go on to it post occasionally and then slightly lose steam. And I, knew I know that I'm somebody who's kind of all or nothing so I was like okay I'm going to do it every Tuesday there's going to be a big substantial piece of writing there um so because I also think that for me I felt like well I owed the people who are bothering to you know sign up and there are some people I know who are very successful on Substack who sometimes post oh I haven't got anything to say this week which I understand why people do that because it's hard you know doing a big piece of writing but I feel like that, I mean, they're very successful. So obviously people don't mind that much, but I find that surprising. Like I never want someone to come to feel, oh, she's like shortchanging me or cutting corners at all. Um, maybe I should get a bit more fluid with it. But yeah, I, I, I really putting my some of my best work up there, certainly. That's so beautiful to hear. And obviously having been on Substack for a little while, I've seen lots of different approaches I've seen a model of approaches that felt where it was almost like a blueprint like this is what you do on Substack this is what you charge annually this is what you charge monthly and this is what you do and it was all around writing but obviously with me having a, a different career background I was like how can I hold community how can I hold space for Substack education that isn't about your grammar must be absolutely bang on and you have to work with an editor on every piece because I do feel like there's something in a freedom of being able to just hone your craft with an audience, you know, which is definitely what I do. I don't mm. class myself as a professional writer, although I have been paid to write. Like that's not at all who I am. Like I'm a creative that likes to write and it's a it's a way of self-expression for me and it's a way of being playful and not being too hard on myself. I think, you know, we've all got those perfectionist tendencies in certain areas of our life. And with writing, I'm like, I'm just not like that. I'm like, well, mm. I'm not a writer, so it's fine, you know? So being able to be in a sea of how other people have demonstrated holding a community has been super interesting. But for me, there's definitely been that fallout, like you say, of like, wait, I've paid for your writing. I want to pay to support you. And now you're not here and you haven't been here for weeks. I don't mm. know what this is anymore. You know, because when it was set up, we, we fill in the three little boxes that say, this is what you'll get. This is what mm. I'm doing. And for me, like, it's just felt like a professional commitment a job, a space holding, like something where people can rely on me. And if I did, obviously, if something happened, of course, you know, you have to say, actually, something's going on in my life. And to get the balance, I'm going to have to pause paid subscriptions or take a break or whatever it is you need. We're not machines, but I do feel like there's something in, oh, well, you know, it's only however much a year or however much a month, it doesn't matter. And there's a culture of that that's crept in that I'm a bit disappointed in, you know, so to right. hear you set out your stall and be like this is me and I'm doing it and I'm putting all of this energy and time and all of this beauty for the readers that are there and committing I think is not only beautiful for me to hear but also very encouraging because I feel like otherwise we'll get this sort of reputation as people who have a paywall on Substack as a thing of like well I don't know whether to trust that or not do you know what I mean yeah. 
Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that. And I'm I'm really interested in your view of it, having kind of watched it for a you know, longer period of time. And I regret not going on to it sooner. But, you know, we do things when we I did try sooner. And we do things when we. When well, we I can, think it sounds we... exactly the right time, you know, Clover, because it's been that little bit of build up towards this book, you know, your fourth yeah. book. And so it's been able to, you know, those people that you were holding on Instagram, I'm sure some of them will, will come over or have already come over. Come over. Yeah. And I think this blend of like, it's not that long before you launch the book is actually it's it's really savvy whether you meant it or not that I didn't mean, really I didn't. It was just, yeah it was just when I but um I'm I'm pleased that you yeah I think it's important that because there are a lot of people on the Substack, obviously and there are a lot of people there as writers on Substack. and so one of the things that kind of concerns me slightly sometimes is that everyone is an expert on on something or other and um you know, there are so many pieces to write, like how do you, uh, to, to read, how do you choose what to read? And I think I'm hoping that the kind of, you know, people like you and like me who are really delivering will, and, and I hope, you know, I know that writing takes stamina. I know that it takes real energy. It's not just sitting down and lighting a candle and like, you know, hoping for the, you know, inspiration. It's like, you have to just sit down and do it and, you know, I'm here at 6.30 in the morning. It's when I'm often writing at 6.30 in the morning or 5.30 in the morning. And it's 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 hard work and you have to keep on turning up at that blank page again and again and again. And I'm I'm really hoping that the kind of quality content on there, whether it's writing or video or, you know, community space, as you say, that, that you create will kind of in, endure and... Um, yeah, it's interesting what, you know, whether, what how it will change. I mean, I'm interested to see the engagement as well. I hope that I can maintain engagement and keep it, keep it growing and keep it kind of really, really healthy as well. Because as I say, that's like that engagement with other people is a really important, important thing for me. Um, but it's all still a bit of an experiment, really. Although it's a mass, you know, it's, it's massively successful. It, it is, is all, it's it's all still quite new. And, that, and that's beautiful, isn't it? But that's again where you need the stamina. You know, it's like it is an experiment. But how long is an ex is it an experiment for? And for me, it's been an experiment for two years. I'm still going. It's like yeah, you can't really rest on your laurels. I can't. You know, I'm always like looking at the stats and kind of working out for others what's going to be the best fit, like how things are landing, how the, I mean, even the attention span has changed. It's a lot shorter than it was a year ago. And really? I feel sort of sad saying that. And it's not true for everyone. There are still a lot of people reading in email or like picking up a, an iPad and going, oh, wow, you know, Clover's written a piece. I'm going to make a cup of tea and I'm going to sit down with it. But it was all that before. And now there are various different things to pull on people's attention. I've noticed that the way people respond to me, the comments are shorter. And if I ask two questions, I'll just get a response to one, you know, they'll hone yeah. in on one. Whereas you, yeah. before then it was like, if I ask two quite exploratory questions, people will make time to respond to both and be in that space of thinking about it and giving it space and time. And, you know, we know what social media is and there is that social media element to Substack, which is great for growth and great for shares and great for the whole web of creativity and writers supporting writers and all that sort of stuff. But there is this other thing at play where we're like, just sit with me a minute. And how do we create that? How do we hold people and the familiarity and the and the day of the week, you know, picking that that constant kind of connection for someone is is a massive part of it. I I think you know that familiarity of it's yeah. a Tuesday and Clover's publishing is is yeah. magic actually. Yeah, I mean I I hope that there are not introduction of too many more notes, threads, DMs because it becomes too much like social media. I yeah, can what get... else is there? What else is going to give us? There's so many tools. Yeah, I know. I can get that on Instagram very in a very pleasing way, and and I do like it for for me, for the kind of long form writing. So I don't want to get too distracted by the, you know, by the, all the bells and whistles, I suppose. Um, and that sometimes, and I haven't totally got into threads and, and I do them a little bit and threads and notes, and I find them a little bit confusing still. Um, but maybe I should be using them more for growth, but I also want to, I want to use it 
I don't want to have to strategize it. I want it to be a really quite a pure space and for people to find me if they can. Um, I think with Instagram, like, you know, that algorithm having to post at a certain time of day and reels and do this number of hashtags and it just becomes quite um I'm not a very well organized person and when it becomes too much like a spreadsheet I I mean I can't even open a spreadsheet I'm terrible with them so I don't I don't want it to be like that I want it to be about words and whilst it is then yeah that that is working for me if it if it becomes too much if if in, if if Substack introduced their version of reels I think I might like mm. I mean, I know it's got video, but, you know, mm. something, you know, remember when reels happen, it's like, oh, my God, how do I learn to do this kind of really quite complex video editing, basically? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, so, yeah, I hope that it I hope that the words keep their value on Substack. Mm. And I think they will. You know, I think that this the yeah, the transitions that I've seen and the writers that have held steady have lent into that curiosity around their practice. And, you know, do they want to host a Zoom meetup? If they don't, then they don't, you know, yeah. if they do and that feels joyous and lovely and they do it live or whatever they do, you know. So it's more like you can you've got that space to decide because I think your readers and your community support you no matter what and like you say there are a lot of bells and whistles but I don't think success on Substack is down to using all the bells and whistles yeah. I use them because I talk you know I've got to talk about what yes. Substack can do and enable but yeah if and on Creatively Conscious which was the first publication I started which I call like a digital magazine I don't use them all you know, I'm yeah. not interested in using them all. That's not what that space is about. So I do think it's almost about closing the tabs in a way, which I had the experience of because it didn't used to have all that stuff. So yeah. all the tabs were closed and my attention was my own, my writing space, the blank space was my own. I wasn't writing for anyone else. I was literally pouring my heart out onto a page and somehow enjoying it being posted to the internet not wanting not caring if anyone saw it I guess it was just like this is just a cathartic experience for me so yeah I do think there's real power in words and real power in artistic craft of writing and people are so connected to that and people are so in awe of people like you Clover like that's the thing people are like aspiring to be able to write like that and wondering if that is a lifelong practice and one day they'll write like the paragraph that is the paragraph that they've been like looking for all of their lives mm. you know this genius paragraph or whatever so it's such an interesting playground of mm. words and creativity and yeah curiosity I think and we can mm. we can do that with it and that feels really good I wanted to ask you about book promotion so I've had a couple of authors come on the podcast and talk about Substack in relation to book promotions what they are allowed to do what publishers say oh no actually we're not comfortable with that or we don't really understand Substack so I'd love to understand more about how it's been for you and if it's felt like a positive place to just be able to keep saying and mentioning okay I've got this new book and this is what it's about like how's that all felt for you? Yeah, definitely. I have. Um, I'm aware that in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking more about the book, and um, because you know I'm coming up to publication period, I've been also been writing articles for the press in England. So it's very much you know the publicity is very much on my mind, and I think that we always feel. I mean, I always feel a bit bad in some. Actually, I'm, I don't anymore. But I used to feel bad like promoting my own work, but it's so important as an artist to promote your own work you know, very few other people are going to, you have to shout about what you do and you have to be kind of vocal about it. And I've found, um, I mean, I've really enjoyed the feeling of finding new new readers. That's what I've enjoyed on, on Substack. And I'm interested with people, you know, I've written, my first book was about kind of trauma, really, The Wild Other. My second book was about motherhood called uh, My Wild and Sleepless Nights. And my third was about grief, the red of my blood and this new one is about home the giant on the skyline and so there's sort of I hope something for everyone in some way or another and I hope that if somebody read my what you know read a most more recent book and really enjoyed it they would go back to the earlier work because I very much see them each book stands alone but they do kind of work together like the whole story is there it's my story it's my voice and and um and so Substack has you know I've published so in my experience publishers know very little about social media honestly they really don't and and they would say that as well like you know more about Instagram and how to promote on Instagram for example I've just like everyone I've just taught myself that basically you know I started doing more during the pandemic and um and 
that's been you know it's been really really useful definitely with substack i put a bit of um i put i did i put an extract up there uh which hadn't been anywhere else i've done a little bit of reading as well the publisher's been you know absolutely fine with it because i think it's all helping you know it's all kind of contributing to this picture of whether it's instagram stuff in the national press doing podcasts doing book events i'm just about to uh, leave America on Friday and come to England and I'm doing like Guernsey Literary Festival I'm speaking at Blackwell's in Oxford um, talking at my local bookshop in Wantage Chorleywood so there's a kind of a big picture of all these different pieces that help to create visibility and find people and create dialogue and create interest and Substack is just one part of that but I do know I was talking to a publisher in America um, cause I'm not actually published here at the moment. I'm trying to change that. And she said, Substack is the place which converts readers from Substack, you know, converts sales. Basically it's more important than Instagram. And she cited one of her authors who had a massive Instagram following and a massive podcast. And this person's real sales came from, from Substack basically. So it's really, you know, it's really valuable and important. Um, in terms of, you know putting work out there that hasn't because obviously you have to be careful if a book is being public like do, does the publisher mind about a bit of it going out before the publication um in my experience no they don't I mean my you know my following is a few thousand it's 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 nice it's healthy but it's not like gonna it's somebody's not going to read it there and think oh I'm not going to buy it you know it's only going to help basically so the publisher has been enthusiastic about it and as I said they're not I mean I'm 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 curious about the fact that publishers agents editors I know that they look at Substack but whether they're I don't know how much they're commissioning off there or publish you know thinking oh there's someone who writes really well I could represent them or publish them and I'm I'm curious from my conversations I've had with other writers on Substack that it I don't feel like that's happening in a in a major way but maybe it is happening behind the scenes and you know I just don't know about it I've seen I've seen it with um like home cooks and kind of cookery books I've seen it yes. happen yeah. um but I haven't seen it in other mediums yet not to say that it's not happening but I think the the swell of America and American writers and because Substack launched in America and then Farah Store, the head of UK partnerships started just a couple of years ago. So that, you know, the UK partnerships have only just been building for a couple of years. So it's not that long. So I'm not sure. And I do have a few clients that are agents and I have a few clients that are kind of publishers and are kind of leaning in and are asking questions about the newsletter function right so there's mm. this kind of hybrid place where publishers are like mm, well maybe mm. I could have this for this type of specific group that I want to speak mm. to so there is some curiosity um I, th I feel like it's still super interesting like everyone's personal story like I had an author on who'd had two Instagram DMs to ask her to write a book and she hasn't got a particularly huge Instagram presence but that's what happened you know and it was like wow magic that's what's happened it's like it yeah. does happen you know so it's one of them isn't it where I think we're just figuring that out and leaning into it and this kind of confusion around can I serialize should I serialize should I audio record parts of it what should I do when it's out on submission you know the, these kind of <laughs> tangled debates go on yeah. with, with writers where they're like is this safe can I do this is this can all right do, does this yeah. help yeah I mean I've got friends who are publishing stuff that hasn't yet been published in a in a book in book form on the substack and I would be a bit more nervous about that personally because I know that when I'm writing a book, I have to like I'm writing a new book and and that subject of the new book is is nowhere near my substack. Like I'm not writing. I mean, I've said this before. It's about relationship. It's about long. It's about commitment, marriage and sex. I'm not going to write on Instagram about that because on substack. Sorry, because I know that even if you talk about a book too much, if you talk about your ideas too much, you can. They, they go out into the world and then they lose their kind of force. Force is a word that I'm really enjoying at the moment. They're kind of, you know, their energy and their power um, because they, they're being read and shared by other people. So I wonder whether I personally would feel, but I, and I know people are doing it successfully of like serializing stuff that hasn't yet been published, whether they get a book deal off the back of that. I don't know. That's yeah. It's all kind of 
new world slightly isn't it it's all a new world yeah and it's what's what was interesting to me when I first joined was people that were serializing and then locking like the last bit of the book somehow in like an ebook that you bought you know off platform and like all of these different yeah. models was like well, that's cool like I'm really into it I'm just really into all of the creative vehicles and ideas yeah. I think we have to like you say I have, use, yeah. the, use the force that we have the genius that we have to go but this is how I want to do it this is mm. my personal way with this platform and all of its mm. gifts mm. I am thinking, I'm recording a second series of my podcast, Tiny Acts of Bravery, and I am thinking about, should I put that, should I host that entirely on Substack? But I still don't know what that actually means and what that means for potential advertisers. I just don't know. It's all quite technical as well. And I'm not, you know, I'm not technically adept at any of this. So my 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 thing is in the words and is in the communication and is the, mm. in the conversations. It's not so much in the... um. Yeah, I just find it quite hard, like, working out. It what... is, and it's also, it takes energy, right? Like, yeah, you know, definitely. if you use the energy on figuring out the tech stuff, and um, I, just quickly for anybody listening around the podcast thing, it is literally free hosting, that's it. And then the free hosting, the RSS feed put, um plugs into all of the other platforms so this podcast you can listen to on apple Podcasts, you can listen to on spotify and there are other places that substack tell me that people listen to it and i don't even understand how that works but i could probably ask my husband i think he knows a bit more about how podcast li like listens work so but... if you put it onto substack then thinking well maybe it'll get a few extra followers then well somebody if somebody could then li listen to it on apple Podcasts, it's not they don't they're not getting anything extra special if you say put it behind a pay paywall so yeah so you can well you can obviously you can paywall it for sure and you can set that up through to apple podcasts as well i don't know about how it works with spotify because i've not done it but um the reason that i did it this way was obviously because it's part of my work but also because i wanted to invite community back to substack so the podcast that i host with um a colleague company of two which is a podcast for mothers and it's very it's very slow grow we do four, four podcast episodes a year the invite constantly through the audio is come back and talk to us like you know find the community because we wanted to record for the people that are feeling quite lost and lonely and that kind of whole redefinition of self you know and if you especially if you have your own business as well and how hard that can all feel doing the juggle mm -hmm. so that there's that constant invite back to community which we're both passionate about and similarly with this podcast because I fa usually phase the way it goes out so it'll go to paid subscribers as an you know unlisted YouTube clip and people can listen to the whole thing watch the whole thing if they want and then there'll be a conversation invited if they want that depending on the topic and then it gets edited and goes out as a podcast and obviously because it goes out as a substack post people then circle back a couple of days later and say I really love this conversation and then they'll say whatever action it is that they've taken so like I've followed this person I've subscribed to this person I had Tanya last week and somebody went and booked the retreat that she's hosting with Emma oh, Gannon yeah. which is like oh cool I think you work with Tanya as well don't you yeah I've done lots of yes. retreats I'm, I'm doing one on Monday we're doing one oh on there you go we oh wow well, you're really busy yeah potentially doing one on the 13th of June potentially I haven't okay I, I, quite sure yet, yeah but yeah I've done I've done quite a few retreats with them oh, with them and Tanya, Tanya, yeah. yeah so I'm super curious because I'm writing a memoir I'm giving myself like five years maybe ten but I would love to come to one of your retreats so we might pop up in person I feel like yeah. Northumberland is like really far from everywhere but into London it's like three and a half hours on the train so then if it's anywhere just outside of London it's yeah. not that big a deal like I could do it's it it's funny because living in America like suddenly it gives you a different perspective yeah on... right it's like I'll drive six <laughs> hours to the mall no problem yeah yeah I know yeah oh, oh that would be love. I would I, I mean I know that I love teaching I feel really passionate about teaching all of the teaching that I do at the moment is is in real life I don't do anything online I might change that but at the moment I do some powerful stuff some powerful work with people around writing your story and shame and the kind of releasing from shame and it needs to be in person and they're beautiful days which and watching people during the course of the day write some brilliant stuff kind of share some incredible stuff and leave just inspired and invigorated is a really and also watching the quality of their writing there's something there's an exercise I do with po poetry that just like totally changes the way people write and 
I'm really proud of what I've developed actually with because it's a day retreat and I explained to my husband me and we were having a walk the other day and he said well what exactly do you do on the retreat you know what do you do so I talked him through it step by step and he said wow that's like a SAS supercharged version of a memoir retreat because I really get people doing a lot of stuff straight away and it's really intense and I think therefore it's really good value because people get a lot from it and can leave within a day having yeah having changed how they feel about their own life how they kind of present you know um not present themselves you know how they they express themselves and that's such a privilege I really do love it so please come on one it'd be great yes no I I, I do mean it you know I'm like I'm 99% there I think now that Luna is three things are so much easier you know everything yeah. shifts doesn't it when you get into that space like she's three and a half now yeah and I'm really into the in-person stuff as well I was so nervous about being in person and doing in-person stuff like post pandemic my husband's really sick and so we were really nervous about getting COVID again and that whole space and something's lifted like the fog's lifted but I've got so much that I want to say and write about in that in that sphere so it will be so good to do that right anyway but I'll talk to them about that all day I've got some reader questions for you Clover if that's okay yeah absolutely. so um my yeah my lovely community and I did do a couple of whatsapp shout outs as well to people who I know love and have read your work um, and are very excited about the new book so there was a couple that came in that were very similar and they wanted to know if you do have any plans to write fiction in the future. And I know you, you're you very clear in your about page, like the type of writer you are and why you write. And mm. I think they're just wondering, is there a spark there? Like, are you interested in it? Could it take you somewhere else? Might it happen? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I have to say that my writing is becoming more, um, ex not experimental, because if somebody said to me, oh, this is an experimental book, I'd think, oh, I don't really don't want to read an experimental book, to be honest. But my writing is is developing and moving outwards. So it's becoming more um, kind of creative, I suppose, in the way that I, because I'm talking about emotions, you know, take a big emotion. But for me, the place that I walk through daily, my psychic life is is big and imaginative. So, you know, when we say memoir, that's a very kind of it's more like life writing basically and the new book that I'm writing goes into that even more and personally at the moment I don't have a need to write fiction because I can do so much creatively with my memoir writing um if that changes you know or if I get to a point of like well I've written about all these different aspects of my life which I hope other people will find themselves reflected you know that I can't, I can't see what else I'll do then I would think about it but I I also yeah I if writing is really hard it's really hard writing a book is really hard writing four books is really hard it doesn't get easier it really doesn't get easier and um so unless you like really really want to write fiction you know I don't want to do it because I well I feel like I should write I should feel like I should but if I really need to write it then I then I will do so I would never say never but um I just love the space that I'm in at the moment and I love the creative possibilities of it. So, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm writing, I've, I'm commissioned for another two books. I've got loads more. I keep having these other ideas thinking, Oh, that's the thing that I could write about next. So there's no shortage of ideas around the emotions of our, of my life, of our lives, I suppose. Um, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm at at the moment. Incredible. Thank you so much for talking to that point, because I think it just, it really speaks to that we're all so unique in that, aren't we? We're all so mm. unique and you're so fed and fueled by what it is that you're here to do. And it's so beautiful to speak mm. to someone so purposeful about their creativity. It's a joy. Oh. Um, so you, you touched on this a little bit. The other question was around how your craft has evolved and your relationship with your own craft over the four books. Obviously we've, zoomed out a little bit in terms of the book writing process and you, you're saying you know you've, you've got another two books that you commission for and there'll be deadlines associated to that so yeah how has it evolved you and your relationship to your own work and how you feel about your work over the course of the four books yeah so it's so it's really changed you know with the first book I, I had a story that I really wanted to write which was about the thing the big thing that has kind of formed me emotionally was the love that my mother gave me as a child. And then, and I had a very, very secure, very loving childhood. And then when I was 16, she had a horrendous accident on a horse. I love horses. We grew up with horses. They're a massively important part of our life. And then she had this riding accident that left her 
in a coma and then profoundly brain damaged for 22 years. She couldn't do anything, couldn't walk, talk. She didn't know who I was. She had multiple health problems. She was very, very, very ill for 22 years. And that really, like, had, you know, that continues to have a really big effect on me. It's a trauma that has stayed with me because it was like an ongoing grief. And I, so when, when she was still alive, I was trying to work out how to write about that. And I was doing a lot of journalism, a lot of confessional journalism at that time, but I couldn't really write about her while she was still alive. And I thought she'd live, she actually lived until her late seventies. She had her accident at 52. She lived until her late seventies. She died in 2013 when I was in my thirties. And it was after that, that I started, that I wrote her, not really her story, what happened to her. And then what I did as a reaction to that and how I process trauma. And I'm very proud of that book. It's Liz Gilbert um, was talking about it the other day. I did a bookshop event with her in DC and she said, the world other is in my top 10 books that I've ever read. I'm very, very proud of that book. It's full of a lot of stuff happens in that book. There's a lot of adventure. There's like facing adversities. There's, I go to Texas, I go to Russia, I go to Ireland, and I'm kind of searching for something of a way of, I'm actually searching for my mother, essentially. Like she was alive and yet she was totally un, unreachable. And I was taking myself into kind of dangerous places as a way of facing the trauma. Um, and then, I, and then I got to the end of that book and I enjoyed the process. And then I wanted to write another book and I, my my fifth baby had just been born and my my first child was an adolescence and he was really in a lot of trouble at school and going through normal adolescence stuff and I thought this is like wow this is a lot to be holding five kids baby adolescent all the ages in between so I wanted to write about motherhood because also I'd had a very adventurous life where I'd gone off and done a lot of day you know, ridden in rodeo bucking horses and rodeos in Texas and people said oh you're really brave and I and that was so brave of you to go off and do that travel. And at that time I was at home with a baby, with colic, a toddler who was incredibly full on, a preschooler, a sort of 11 year old and an adolescent who was being expelled. And I thought going off and traveling to Texas and following my dreams was not brave. Being at home with these kids, now this is bravery. To do this day after day after day requires courage and stamina. So I wanted to write about that big internal landscape of motherhood. And, and it was really that book, I think, My Wild and Sleepless Nights, that taught me and showed me that you can, a memoir doesn't have to be about a ton of major stuff happening. The, the world other is very event, there's a lot, there's a big accident, there's big adventures, there's big, then in My Wild and Sleepless Nights, my son, my son gets born, my eldest son gets expelled. I deal with it. You know, that's kind of what happens. But but you but you follow me, you 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 ride with me through this kind of the the I mean, you know what it's like being a mum. It's not kind of um, you know, quiet, lovely, the idea of it being all sort of chicks and pink or blue. You know, those kind of ideas of a sort of softness around motherhood. That's not my experience of it. It's 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 hardcore. It's really, really hardcore and tough. And I wanted to convey what that felt like. And and that, yeah, that taught me a lot about the kind of writing process and how somebody said that reading my work is like is like nature writing for the internal body, which I just found it was The Guardian. It was a review in The Guardian. And I thought that was a really, really wonderful way of describing it. Somebody said reading Clover Stroud is like a whole body experience because you ex you really experience and feel it all. Um so I've, t yeah, and then, you know, I was working on something else and then my sister died and, and I was th flung into absolutely horrendous grief. And I, without wanting to sound arrogant, I've written the books that I wanted to read. When I wrote the book about motherhood, there wasn't really at that time another book, apart from Rachel Cusk's book, my A, a Life's Work, there wasn't really a book that kind of went into the horror and the beauty of motherhood at the same time. And when Nell died, I read Joan Didion, I read C.S. Lewis, but I couldn't really find a book that described what I was going through that first year of being a sort of relatively young woman in my 40s, you know, not grief at the end of the life, but grief in midlife. And this is terrifying. Where's it going to take me? So I've, and again, with home, like I've written the books that I want, that I needed to read that would have been helpful to me to to read, I suppose. And that's And that's how I've kind of, you know, then I've I've understood. I was talking to um, a, a writer in America called D Danny Shapiro the other day for my podcast, and um, 
she has also written three or four memoirs and I was saying you know it's unusual to meet someone who's written a lot of memoirs and she was talking about she'd been described as a public contemplative and I think that's what I'm doing is public contemplation of a big theme and you take a theme like home and um, you know you really really delve in what does it really feel like what is the color of it what does it what does it taste like smell like what does it feel like to touch like really really kind of understand it and that that's how the books have developed and I've realized I've understood that the stuff that I so in this book there is a you know there's a there's a giant in this book to me he is actually a real giant and because he's part of my psych psychic landscape and he was kind of there to me whilst I was going through this big process of should I stay here or should I go now and I see him in the same place on the bridge by my house in in he's about he's in the book about three or four times and I talk to him I feel quite emotional thinking about him actually now if you went to that same place you know you're not going to see a giant but he, but I hope that he will feel absolutely re as real to you as he has felt to me and that giant in a way is the you know the internal dialogue that that we all have I have it basically the entire time like thinking talking to myself about emotion and what stuff feels like so it's finding new creative artistic um means you know vehicles beings colors senses ways of of um of uh communicating something of 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 expressing something and that's where my memoir is taking me and i'm taking it further in this one that i'm writing next which is you know the question about fiction it's not it's everything in my memoirs are completely and utterly real but you have to sometimes use as i say you know something like my my giant for example to express a complicated a complicated idea it doesn't the memoir does not have to be about this spe this specific thing happened but but the way that you write about it is there is absolute truth it has to be true you know i say at the end of the prologue to this book um um i say something like i don't know of what follows i don't know how much of it really happened but i know that all of it is true because it is emotionally true and i'm really interested in that kind of liminal space i suppose where you can do that um and hopefully do it successfully but it's an exciting i feel excited by i feel i'm 40 49 i was 49 last week and i feel really excited by midlife really excited by like kind of where it's going by the creative growth and possibilities so it feels um yeah things feel feel kind of positive at the moment that's so lovely to hear that kind of positivity at 49 I think at 42 I'm just like what is this you know, yeah like... no, no, I felt weird <laughs> I, I found my 40s really, really I loved my 30s I felt empowered yeah. Yeah. I had I loved it my my early 40s and we did have a lot of personal trauma and very great sadness and loss mm. but that 42 43 44 45 was really really tough mm. and I feel like I've I don't know maybe I'm about to go into another tough stage but I do feel like I've kind of broken through a bit of a really difficult bit and we're just into a kind of sometimes you're like bicycling uphill in a storm and sometimes you're freewheeling down a hill and at the moment yeah. of course it's like it's difficult it's still difficult it's never you know mm -hmm. life is never straightforward is it but it's but I definitely felt my I think the four early 40s when you're just trying to figure out the new decade is hard the new, the new decade yeah the new invite as well I just I do feel it's an invitation that I didn't know was coming like that's how I feel I feel there's a lot mm -hmm. to say in that and a lot I wasn't expecting I think being in like I'm still in early motherhood with Luna as well is like oh okay like there's a lot here and it's beautiful to hear you speak about the where you exist in that writing like what I felt listening to you I felt really emotional actually I was like don't cry on your podcast Claire you're all right and <laughs> what I felt was like it feels like there's another level of being awake that you are able to conjure up. Like I have read your books and I do feel, you know, there's an intensity there where it's like, I wasn't awake before, but I am now. And it's like, it's such a gift, Clover. It's such a gift that you have and that you've honed and that you share with the world. And I just, I just know that people listening, if they're hearing you talk for the first time, I know I've got some folks in 
Australia and some new people that might be kind of new to your work I know they'll be listening thinking what wow like what is this space I feel so yeah excited and invited into it and Mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you for that well it's just lovely hearing that and and knowing that um knowing that you know my words and the pain of my experience because I do not you know you've read my work I do not hold back on the pain of experience at all and I do not hold back on on anything really and I um you know I try to try to express things with as much clarity and honesty as possible and knowing that um my son's just got up here you go you can have this Esther. I'll see you in a moment. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're just we're wrapping up. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. But, well, um, we've done an hour there, so yeah. Knowing we'll that up, the yeah. um, <laughs> knowing that my experiences, my painful experiences, connect with can connect with you and help you and open something up for you, and I'm really into this idea of like using my writing to enable people to live kind of bolder, brighter lives. And the brightness means looking at the darkness. You know, I really, really, really believe that. It means really contemplating, really kind of staring into the darkness. And and then something emerges, which is clarifying and is and is awakening. It's a lovely thought that. So thank you. It's a real, yeah, it's a real privilege to hear that. That's good. Okay. So I would just like to wrap up by asking you if you can guide people to your Substack. I think you called it on the life, on the way life feels. Is that correct? On the way life. Yeah. On mm. the way life feels. And I post every Tuesday. I'm there on, usually do a bit of video every week as well. Once I launch the book, life's very busy at the moment. The book comes out on the 8th. I will then, um, I'm in England for a few days doing events and then I'll be back. Um, and I will, hopefully do more yeah more kind of like live meetups I'd like to do that I enjoy talking to people so I'd like to do more um you know occasional occasional meetups maybe even like a occasional creative writing session would be really fun to see just to experiment and play around with it a bit more um but I'd love to see see anybody there or on my Instagram as well which is clover.stroud um but yeah both places are good places to find me perfect and your book is out 8th of May did you say yes yeah 8th of May and so you can pre-order it now so one of the things that I've learned in this last little while is that pre-orders are really really important to authors and the book sales from the pre-order period are counted with the first week of sales which can enable all sorts of things for authors mm -hmm. so if yeah. you really enjoyed listening to us talk today and you're within that window that's great go and buy the book um and if it's in the future then Go and buy all four and sit with them for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Send yourself off on a retreat um, with Clover's words. I'd really, um, yeah, I'd really encourage people to read Clover's work. It's very beautiful. Thank you for being here, Clover. Thank you, Claire. It's been really, really just a joy talking to you. I've loved it. Thank you. Okay, and good luck in England. I hope it goes well. Thank you very much.